welcome to uh, the video on psychiatry. This is uh, the video on how to take a psychiatric history. is one of the four in the series. I would recommend that before coming to this, you would have seen the introduction to psychiatry. What we're going to do today is uh, first we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why we take a psychiatric history, what's the point, then a little bit about how you go about taking a psychiatric history, and then I'll spend some time uh, telling you a little bit about how uh, you should present a psychiatric history. Uh, so the first thing is the point. So what's the point of taking a psychiatric history and how how do those work? So I told you in the introduction that uh, the act of inter interacting with a, a patient involves uh, looking at the patient's behavior, their emotions and their thoughts, uh, just like any doctor would do. Those uh, are the, how, That is how mental illness presents its symptoms. But what follows is an inference of what state of mind that patient was when those behaviors, emotions and thoughts were uh, presented to us. And based on those um, uh, inferences, we make judgments uh, it, uh, that was a normal mind or uh, that was normal but it was still appropriate given the circumstances or no, that was a disturbed state of mind or there was mental health issues, so health. Uh, so uh, are we using the uh, health as a, a spectrum in which to categorize states of mind? So is this mentally ill or is this a um, disordered mind um, or is this a mind that can be explained through a pathology, a psychiatric pathology. Uh, I'm going to take that uh, a little bit further in this video and focus a little bit on that process by which a doctor makes an inference uh, about the state of mind of a patient. And in order to do that, we need to know the context in which those behaviours happen, what the behaviours were, and what are the emotions and the thoughts of the patient. And we do that by taking a psychiatric history. And of course, we need to know the facts. We need to know what happened. And we also need to know the time scale, what happened when, and what came before what. And we need to make sure that we understand how all those things are related, and also how they're related to the context. And this is how we take a psychiatric history. We gather facts, we establish the time time scales and we are aware of the circumstances around those facts. But we do something else. Uh, we don't just take a history. What we uh, need to do in order to make a judgment is we need to understand a little bit more about that other than the history. We need to understand what are the experiences that led that patient to behave in a particular way or where those emotions come from. We need to understand what are the values of the patient, what's important, and we need to understand what is the context and what is the main narrative. So a patient might uh, present with an overdose and the fact is that they took an overdose. Um, but actually when the patient tells us the story from their point of view, they might say, well, this is my 11th overdose in, in three months. Uh, what, what I'm really upset about is that my boyfriend left me. Uh, so it's not just about taking a history of what happened, but having a narrative, uh, not just what follows, but what, not just what follows what, but why something follows the other. Um, so the interaction and between. Uh, events and emotions and how that is constructed into a narrative that has meaning and what is the meaning that we draw from it and what the patients draw from it. So a story, not a history. And also in a story, there's usually causal attributions. So we say, well, the reason why she take the overdose is because her boyfriend left her. Or we might say, no, the reason why she took the overdose is because this is what she does every time she gets upset. Or the reason why she took an overdose is because her mom always took overdoses. So uh, you can see we can make different causal attributions on the same history. So what we need to do is uh, gather not just the history, but the story of the patient and what means what. And that's what we call a formulation. So we don't just collect a history, we, co we collect a formulation. We collect the facts, but we also collect the narrative that explains and attributes causality. 
So that's the point of taking a psychiatry history. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we go about doing this. So the first thing we need to know is that we need to prepare ourselves before taking a psychiatry history. Psychiatry history usually take a while. There are emotional experiences for the patients and for the psychiatrist. So it's worth spending some time preparing. So we need to consult with other professionals who might have seen the patient before. We need to review the documentation. We need to know, for instance, if the patient has presented their history four times in the last three hours. Um, or and, and because of that, we need to get uh, consent. We need to make sure patients don't just take for granted that they are about to repeat the story over and over or to people who they don't know. Consent is quite important when taking a psychiatric history. Also, it's important to get outside views, outside informants. Collateral histories are very important and sometimes it's important to collect those before we meet the patient. We need to make sure we have arranged the setting appropriately. Uh, so sometimes patients become upset, sometimes we become upset. And so it is important that there is privacy, that you're not going to be interrupted and you put some thought as to where you're going to conduct your interview. And you need to be aware of the risks uh, the, uh, um, uh, before you set out. So do you need a chaperone with you? Uh, do you need to be in an open space, etc.? The last thing that is important in the preparation is to become aware of of what the narratives around the patient are before you even meet with them, the existing formulations. What do people think is the matter with them? What do they think is the matter? What do other professionals think is the matter? Uh, mainly to be aware what narratives are there already before we establish our own. So that's what we do during the preparation. The first few minutes are very important in a psychiatric interview. We call that the opening. And the opening is in, in some ways not any different to on a medical interview. You introduce yourself. Um, but it is important from the beginning that we show curiosity, that we are interested in the patient and that they perceive that. And the second is that we allow the patients to present themselves in a good light. Uh, so uh, there is usually shame and guilt around presenting as a psychiatric patient with mental health problems. So it is important to give them the opportunity to show another side of themselves. For instance, I, I am a child psychiatrist. I interview children all the time. I spend a good at least 10 minutes, uh, just making them feel good about themselves. So, uh, and uh, instead of saying, oh, so you're the one who took the overdose or tell me, uh, your parents tell me you've been very naughty in school, I would look at them and say, oh, you've got new Nikes. Uh, uh, those are really cool. Tell me about them. You know, something that allows them to present a side of themselves, which uh, is positive and, and, and they present themselves well. The last thing is that it is important in the opening that you check with the patient that what you already know about them is accurate. You'd be surprised how many times halfway through the interview you realize that uh, uh, some of the things you thought about them are not accurate. So you tell them what you know about them before. And then last, the, the last bit is it's important that uh, they know know that you're listening and that you are listening indeed. Of course, you need to be aware of risks. Uh, um, uh, and sometimes in the opening, uh, you already identify risk factors that might not have been identified in the preparation. And that's what you need to do at the beginning of the interview. Um, and then you uh, go into the interview proper. It is important that you stare your interview uh, between opposite ends of dilemmas. The first dilemma is uh, you need to ask open and closed questions. So an open question is a question that allows for uh, a wide range of answers. For instance, how are you feeling? Whilst a closed question is a question that narrows the possibilities of answers. For instance, are you feeling tired? Yes. So using open and closed questions, you can establish some control of the interview. So you need to negotiate, learn to use those two types of questions appropriately. The second tension is uh, a bit more um, uh, abstract. It's the idea of having an interview that flows and is directed by the patient and they tell you what they want to tell you versus an interview where you control tightly where the conversation goes and you make sure you cover all the areas that you want. There are different 
different versions of this um, uh, dichotomy, but it is important that you are aware of how much of the conversation is controlled by you and how much is uh, flows. And similar to this is the idea of during the interview, you need to manage your empathy with the patient with the detachment that is needed sometimes to be able to uh, uh, have control and um, and um, be professional during the interview. And linked to this is the idea that uh, when we interview patients, we often make Make assumptions and those assumptions stops us from being curious. Um, so, for instance, uh, we might see a woman in her fifties and assume that she's married and assume that she's not gay. Um, and those are the kind of, of assumptions that impede our curiosity. So, it's important to remain curious and to be aware of what assumptions we're making. Then uh, the idea of uh, uh, getting narratives and sometimes getting little details are, is quite important and offers a lot of information. But uh, sometimes that uh, is done um, uh, at the expense of being able to cover uh, lots of information. For instance, if somebody tells mm -hmm. us, I've taken six overdoses in the last three years, um, are you going to say, well, tell me a little bit about each of those? Or are you going to look at the last one in more detail? And you need to make choices around uh, um, detail versus coverage. The last uh, tension is the, the tension between what is essentially gathering information or interacting and communicating with the patient. So at one extreme, it's almost like presenting a questionnaire and you just ask questions and move on. Uh, whilst the other one communicating is when you are using the interview as a way of not just receiving information, but also making some change and giving some uh, messages and sometimes even therapeutic. So these are the six kind of dilemmas that one needs to negotiate during the interview. And of course, I can't give you more details about this, otherwise we would be here for hours. Um, but after the interview, it's important that you spend some time closing the interview. So it is important that you warn the patient that you only have three more minutes or five more minutes, so it doesn't come as a surprise, and that you review your headings of the presentation you are about to make, which I'll tell you in a, in a minute. So you have all the information that you need. Sometimes it's helpful to give the patient a summary of what you've concluded following the interview and to check with them. And then it's important important that you explain to the patients what's going to happen next. Um, uh, sometimes um, they would they need to know what you're going to do with the information. And of course, sometimes to say goodbye, sometimes these interviews are quite intimate and the patients don't get to see you again. So it is important to say goodbye properly. Anyway, so this is what uh, we've told, I've told, I'm going to tell you about how to take uh, an interview. So there is, you need to prepare, you need to use the opening well, you need to negotiate those six tensions during the interview, and you need to be able to close it. What I'm going to tell you now a little bit is uh, how to present an interview. Present a psychiatric history is quite a skill and uh, is not as straightforward as it would appear. So um, uh, uh, it is important because you're going to transfer a lot of information to somebody who needs to listen to a lot of things that you're saying. Um, uh, the similar I use is the organization of a fridge. So if you always put ketchup in the second shelf of the right door of your fridge, uh, when you need ketchup, you go in, you find the ketchup. Uh, if there's no ketchup in that shelf, you know you do, you run out, you need to buy more. You don't have to go looking through the fridge. If you live in a flat with uh, other people and everybody puts things uh, uh, how they see fit, if you need ketchup, you need to start looking at, at the fridge and you need to look in every corner until you find it. That's extremely frustrating. It is the same thing with presenting a psychiatric history. Uh, what I'm going to tell you now is which shelves we use in, and which information goes in which shelves. So when you're presenting uh, somebody um, a, a psychiatric history to somebody, uh, you both know what is coming when. So if there is something missing, they know when it's missing. Yes, so that's the point of doing a presentation of a psychiatric history following a given format. Yes, so I'm going to tell you about this format. So the introduction is not that dissimilar to uh, medical presentations, but it is important that you have six bits of information. So I'm going to present Joe Blocks, who is a 35-year-old man uh, who I met in a and &E, uh, 
uh, because he had taken an overdose. Uh, and I'm presenting him because I need to know whether I can discharge him. So those are the six bits that you need to uh, say in the first paragraph. Um, that puts the mind of the person listening to you at ease. And after you've done this, you move on to the first heading of a psychiatric history, which is the presenting complaint. This is a description of what's the problem that brought the patient to you. So you need to start by saying this uh, patient has heard voices for the last three weeks um, and the voices are in his head and uh, they tell him to kill himself. And this is urgent because he's about to try it. Uh, and this is quite risky. Yes. Uh, so those four things are important in the presenting complaint. Uh, so you, what you're saying is what's happening in now. Yes. Um, uh, the next uh, heading uh, it follows from this one, which is the history of the presenting complaint, which is the story of how complaint came to happen. Yes. So it starts with saying the patient was last well, uh, you know, a month ago, uh, and then this triggered it. He gave up his medication or whatever you think. And then what happened following the trigger that came to where the patient is now? And that's the history of the presenting complaint. Often, uh, that is followed by aspects of the mental state examination, which is the subject of the next video, which is a description of what mind the patient is in. But uh, sometimes uh, you put that at the end. Um, uh, what you do after you've given the history of the presenting complaint if you, is you give the psychiatric history. So you would say the problems for this patient started four years ago when he was uh, um, diagnosed with schizophrenia by a community psychiatrist. Um, and then you go on uh, through the, his personal history, what episodes, what happened when in terms of psychiatry, what treatments is that, what responses that, and you end up in the current episode. So this three headings or these four headings are quite important uh, situated in time. So what we do is we start with right now, this minute that I'm talking to you, and then you explain what the problem you're bringing is. And then you bring the history of the problem, and then you give the background to the history of the program. So, so you're going backwards in time. This is uh, quite difficult to do because you need to chop up the stories uh, several times. After you've done that, then you take more specific histories. So uh, a lot of times there are substantial histories of drug or alcohol, and those those histories need to be taken with care and in a way separately. And you follow the same structure. The problem started, there's been this contact with services, this diagnosis, this episodes, this treatment, this response, and um, uh, very important uh, in alcohol history, you need to be able to provide how many units of alcohol they take per week and whether they have withdrawal symptoms and they have dependency. This is very important. And uh, as well, you end up in the current episode. There's another kind of parallel history that is important if it is present, which is a forensic history. That is, uh, uh, people who have had problems with the police or with the courts uh, and patients who have convictions, and it's important to gather those uh, bits of information. It follows the same structure as the, as the drug and alcohol history. When, when the problem started, contact with the police, courts, convictions, episodes, treatment response, it's very important that you uh, um, gather whether there is episodes of violence, of cruelty, of sadism, i.e. that they enjoy cruelty, and a risk assessment linked to the forensic history. And like everything else, you finish with the current episode. There is another type of special subhistory, which is the developmental history. This is particularly important in patients who present with neurodevelopmental disorders like uh, aut autistic people, or people with ADHD or learning difficulties. And it follows the same structure. The problem started in early childhood, um, how they achieve developmental milestones, how they did in school, in care settings, and how they function uh, 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 at the moment, whether they are on any treatment linked to their developmental history. And then you take a medical history. So uh, about 30% of patients who present to mental health settings have significant chronic uh, um, physical pathology. It's important that you get family history, diagnosis, impact on treatment and prognosis of medical conditions. 
And then you move on to more generic background information, which we call the personal and social history. And that has in itself many headings, which uh, start with uh, family psychiatric history. Uh, genetics are very important in a lot of um, uh, psychiatric settings, but also interaction with parents who have mental health problems themselves. You start with uh, proper developmental history, including birth, early development, school care settings, education, achievement, psychosexual history that is part and and, um, uh, um, and marriage and family and children, uh, all the kind of social background, and you end up with how they're functioning at the moment. Uh, so those um, uh, headings are uh, the most important one. Often we end up with a description of the pre-morbid personality, what type of person, or how well they were doing before all these problems started. Usually, at this point, we present the mental state, but I'll tell you more about that later. So uh, we, I've told you why, I've told you how, and I've told, uh, and I've told you how to present. So why you remember, uh, you need to take a history with the facts and the time and the circumstances, but you also need to provide a formulation. So why did this happen? What's the story, not just the history? Then I told you how to to, pre to take a history, and I told you you need to uh, spend time preparing, trying it, uh, carefully opening the interview. Then during the interview, you need to negotiate those six tensions, and then you need to spend some time to close. And then I told you a little bit about how to present, and you remember the metaphor of the fridge. Uh, people expect bits of information in a particular way at a particular time, and that makes communication so much easier, and, and this is a very important skill. So you follow the shells, uh, which include the, the introduction, the presenting complaint, then the history, and then the psychiatric history. Then the, the special histories of alcohol, forensic development, and medical, and then the background history with personal and social history, and you finish with the premorbid personality. So those are the three bits that uh, are important to know when you know about taking a psychiatric history. As I told you before, this is the second of four videos. Uh, uh, this is followed uh, by a video on how to do a mental state examination, and then some about conditions. I hope you will listen to them in a minute. Thank you.